Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining today's webinar on climate change action, the role of natural climate solutions. I'm Chris Field, director of the Stanford Woods Institute for the Environment, the organizer for today's event. The Woods Institute is Stanford's marquee investment in advancing understanding and developing practical solution to our era's pressing environmental problems. Woods scholars team with other researchers, governments, companies, and NGOs to build bridges from research to action to address challenges in climate, health, food, water, oceans, and biodiversity. Today's webinar is our first in a series on natural climate solutions. The next installment coming in October will address climate change solutions related to improving agriculture and the food system. This series is part of a bigger project on the full portfolio of emissions reduction approaches that forms, or at least should form, a US playbook on climate solution options. The webinars will explore technology readiness, scalability, and co-benefits and disbenefits in the context of economic costs. In today's webinar, I'm excited to talk with three experts about natural climate solutions. Natural climate solutions or nature-based solutions refers to a wide array of practices that decrease greenhouse gas emissions from ecosystems or that increase carbon storage resulting in negative emissions, the net removal of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Many natural climate solutions involve protecting or restoring forests. Others involve increasing organic matter in grassland or cropland soils. Still others involve the coasts or oceans. Compared to other approaches for reducing climate forcing, natural climate solutions often have three big advantages. First, the technology tends to be simple and well-known. It doesn't take a breakthrough to know how to not cut down a forest. Second, a wide range of natural climate solutions appear to be affordable, especially compared to other technologies. And third, natural climate solutions often come with important co-benefits in things like habitat improvement, biodiversity conservation, watershed protection, and support for rural, poor, or indigenous communities. Still, there's a lot we don't know about natural climate solutions. One of the main things we don't know is how to unleash the potential and that'll be one of our topics today. But we'll also talk about the risks and possible downsides. The three panelists for today's conversation are Asmarit, Asifa, Berhe, Bronson Griscom, and Becky Chaplin Kramer. Asmarit is professor and Flasco chair in earth sciences at UC Merced, and she's an expert on soils. She focuses on the cycling and fade of essential elements in the critical zone. This includes effects of climate change on the storage of soil organic matter, the role of iron oxides in stabilization and destabilization of organic matter, and the consequences of erosion for carbon sequestration. In addition to extensive work on biogeochemistry, Asmert's made important contributions to the political ecology of land degradation and ownership, particularly the contribution of armed conflicts to land degradation and the ways people relate to their environment. Bronson is a senior director of natural climate solutions at Conservation International where he leads the organization's efforts to reduce global emissions by protecting, sustainably managing, and restoring forests and other carbon storing ecosystems. Prior to joining CI in 2019, Bronson was Director of Forest Carbon Science at the Nature Conservancy. Bronson was the lead author on the definitive and influential 2017 study demonstrating that natural climate solutions could be major contributors to the emissions reductions needed by 2030 to keep global temperature increases under 2C. Becky is the lead scientist for the Natural Capital Project at Stanford, where she oversees model development and application for the freshwater and terrestrial team. Her own research focuses on global ecosystem service assessment, linking earth observations and ecosystem services modeling, and improving our understanding of ecosystem service flows to, from, and mediated by agricultural systems. Becky is also a coordinating lead author on the upcoming values assessment of the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. And she serves on the expert working group consulting on NASA biological diversity and ecological forecasting programs. The format for today's conversation is that I'll start with a few questions. After about half an hour, we'll get to the good part, questions from all of you in the audience. And to get a question in the queue, you can type it at any time into the Q&A box using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. We'll get to as many of your questions as we can. And today we're trying something new to make the conversation a little more interactive. Hope it works. We're at three points using Zoom's poll feature to assemble and share your perspectives. 
we post the first poll question now. Are natural climate solutions getting sufficient priority in the current discussions about dealing with the climate crisis? Unsurprisingly, uh, the people who joined a webinar on natural climate solutions would like to see it get more attention. So with that as a setup, let me turn first to Bronson. And <clears throat> Bronson, I wonder if you can help set the stage for understanding natural climate solutions. You know, what are the most important options? Where are they located? And, and how can we get a feel for the potential and magnitude? Thanks, Chris. Um, and it's a joy and an honor to, to be part of this group. So thanks so much. Um, so let me start with your last, last part of your question, which is the amount. Um, so we estimate that 30% of the global cost effective solution to climate change is through improved land stewardship, what we refer to as natural climate solutions. Um, that is composed of three different pieces, basic pieces of that, of improved land stewardship. One is protection. Uh, you already referred to that, Chris. Um, basically, you know, avoid the, the, the you know, historic, uh, you know, long history of ongoing uh, loss of natural ecosystems. Uh, the other is restoration. So effectively, the reverse of that, to, to sort of re-expand, rewild. Um, uh, especially, you know, in the sort of most degraded and kind of least used, there's huge opportunities to, to sort of rebuild forests and wetlands and other systems. Um, and the third, I think, is probably the least talked about, and actually we're finding that it is probably the largest of the three, is improved management of working lands. Um, about half of the ice-free land on Earth now is under active management, is essentially working lands. Um, and there are a huge number of opportunities to um, to essentially do climate smart uh, management of those lands while maintaining the production of food, fuel, fiber, all the things we need um, from the land. So we're talking about climate smart forestry, climate smart agriculture, things that uh, Asmara knows uh, more about than I do. Um, uh, and I think, let's see, the, 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 I think the third part of your question is about where. So about 70% of this story is in the tropics, right? Which is perhaps not surprising because the tropics are kind of the um, they refer to as the lungs of the planet. Um, it's where things grow fastest. And, you know, not surprisingly, the, you know, the trees grow big um, and where a lot of carbon is stored and sort of cycled. It's a very sort of high metabolism ecosystems there. Having said that, um, uh, th th there's huge contributions all around the world, including temperate and boreal systems. Um, so right here in the U.S., uh, what we found, we've actually done recently to complete a study um, that looks specifically at the opportunities in the U.S. and is a very large potential um, for, um, for natural climate solutions in the U.S., but I think we'll probably get into that later. Thanks. That's great. Let, let me just sort of build on this theme about the, um, the potential in, in managed lands and turn to aspirin. Um, some of the best options for natural climate solutions involve increasing organic matter in soils, where the consequence is often not only carbon storage, but also an increase in fertility and water holding capacity. But soil carbon is invisible to the naked eye and, and it's famously variable, even, even on scales of a few centimeters or even a few millimeters. But do researchers like you have the ability to measure soil carbon with a precision and scale that would support including it in uh, international markets about carbon? Yeah, thanks, Chris. Um, yeah, so uh, as you alluded, obviously, it's, it's not necessarily a straightforward um, uh, act to kind of the skill to measure soils, uh, amount of carbon stored in soil. But, uh, you know, over the last, yeah, I don't know, 100, 200 years that we've been measuring soil carbon, there's been many different methods that were developed. And we now have um, availability of a variety of fairly accurate ways to determine how much carbon is in soil. Uh, some of those approaches um, are time consuming, um, if not in a little bit more expensive than others. But I think the technology is continuously improving to a point where now we even have handheld sensors that people could take out into the field to determine how much carbon's there. Um, and I say this to indicate that, uh, yeah, we can determine things accurately to a reasonable degree, right? Uh, but owing to the fact that soils vary in terms of, you know, their what paramaterial they're formed from, the biota that they support, um, including the biome kind of where you're finding these soils in, um, as well as a range of other processes. Uh, when we try to upscale those numbers to the entire soil profile, or even 
um, uh, on regional uh, landscape scales, obviously we, ha we need a little bit more support in terms of modeling to do so. But I feel like, um, you know, this, this work is continuously improving uh, like most fields in science and it's getting easier and quicker um, to estimate how much carbon is in soil and how it changes with implementation of the different types of management practices that Branson is talking about, right? But I don't believe necessarily that that is um, a huge stumbling block um, for any kind of policy or even uh, market uh, efforts at this point. Um, at best, I think um, some of the questions that are still outstanding in terms of how to extrapolate uh, our estimates from point scale, um, you know, to um, a point where you can say, you know, a farmer stored this much carbon into their field, um, i.e. maybe they need um, this much, um, you know, kind of uh, the price of that carbon. Um, it might require maybe using an app uh, or even using some kind of uh, model at this point. Um, you can't just get at it from one point scale measurement, obviously, but I don't think we are really too far off um, in terms of these estimates. And if anything, I think a lot of the folks that we work with that are interested in, um, in carbon sequestration, not just from a climate perspective, but also for the co-benefits that were discussed, um, see that they see enough benefits for, for doing carbon practicing climate smart land management and improving rate of carbon sequestration in their soils um, to a point where the error bars associated with those measurements are not a huge deterrent. Let me, uh, let me build on the, your, your point about co-benefits is something that Becky's thought a lot about. Becky, one of the big attractions in natural climate solutions is the potential for these kinds of co-benefits. And, and for most of us, I think the concept of a co-benefit is that it's a, a good thing, but, but at least for me, it's a little fuzzy. You made a career from quantifying them. And how do you go about defining and then quantifying the co-benefits that come from an intervention like protecting or restoring a forest? Thanks, Chris. And yeah, I'm really happy to be here in this conversation today. Um, well, so we can predict how a change in ecosystems leads to a change in its benefits to people by modeling the ecological supply of those benefits and the human demand for them and the flow between them. So the supply side is based um, typically on ecosystem processes and functions like bees and other wild pollinators nesting in natural areas that pollinate nearby crops plants growing along streams and on hillsides to trap pollutants, naturally purifying our water, or mangroves, coral reefs, and other coastal habitats that um, can protect us. And it's by attenuating uh, storm surge um, from coastal storms and, and erosion and flooding. So we can model the flow of those benefits to people based on their location and activity, as well as their vulnerabilities to highlight their dependencies on nature. So to use those same examples, bee flight patterns between their nesting sites and pollination dependent crops and the extent of, of dependence on pollination or the path that water takes through a watershed on its way to the stream and the different human uses of that water, including for drinking water or where exactly waves are pounding the shoreline where people and property are exposed. Um, and so all of our information about the planet's habitats, biodiversities, people's activities and locations has really advanced rapidly in recent years and continues to improve every year with um, advances in satellite technology, providing more information more frequently at, at finer and finer uh, temporal and spatial scales up to a, a thousand times finer than previously. So I think we're at a unique moment where we can really start to understand and map these benefits um, and their potential win-wins or, or synergy with uh, nature-based climate solutions. Thank you. Let me stick with this theme of the co-benefits just a little bit. And, and I'm impressed that all three of you really opened with an with a identification of the importance of co-benefits. And one thing we haven't yet talked about is, is the importance for livelihoods, especially of, of rural and indigenous peoples. And, and Bronson, I wonder when you take the global view on where the opportunities are uh, how much they align with sustainable livelihoods for the, the people in the areas where these solutions have the potential to exist? Um, well, so I, just to echo, I think 
of both what Becky is saying and also I think what you're indicating. Um, what's exciting is the level of, of synergy uh, and the level of um, the extent to which, um, you know, there are win-wins. And I think we use, you know, we often, we love to talk about win-wins. Um, there are certainly trade-offs that we have to deal with in some of these, some of these elements of natural climate solutions. But um, there are a number of them for which the, the, the win-wins are, are, are sort of dramatic and, and I think kind of, you know, think of a kind of low-hanging fruit. So let me give you two examples. Um, one of them is um, a lot of evidence from a number of countries that improving land tenure security for local communities and in particular indigenous groups um, tends to result um, in reduced loss of native ecosystems, okay? So um, it, it appears to be that when, you, when we, when we um, support um, the rights of, of local indigenous communities to, um, to essentially to sort of have you know, legal basis for their traditional rights, um, they manage the land very well um, for the benefit of, of all of us. Um, so, so that to me is a kind of clear win-win. Obviously, part of, 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 of supporting the rights of these groups means that we're not going to tell them exactly <laughs> That they have to do exactly what we want for the for the globe, but but the good news is, um, you know, that that will tend to happen, and so um, so I think that that's a that's a a, a kind of a no-brainer. Um, we we you know we should have essentially as part of, of of global climate efforts, we should have a global effort to improve our right for for local indigenous communities. Um, another example that's a little maybe a little more counterintuitive is that. Um, uh, that, uh, that there are a large portion of, of forests and, 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 and natural forests um, are managed for timber production. Now that, and, and, and we, we often, especially in the tropics, we think of, the, of timber production as a kind of a, kind of, you know, the loggers as kind of bad actors, um, kind of these frontier, you know, actors that go in and put in roads and can increase kind of, um, you know, edge effects and, and access to remote forests, which can certainly happen and does happen. Um, However, there's also evidence that there, are, that, that there are a number of good actors in the logging space, and those good actors, the better, the better loggers, um, actually do quite a good job of actually protecting their forests from um, conversion to other land uses. Um, and so if we support and kind of create incentives for, for loggers to be, basically be good stewards of natural forests, um, there's a huge opportunity to um, essentially have essentially professionalize an industry um, that can be that that can um, uh, essentially be good stewards, uh, protect natural forests, while continuing to produce wood and actually improving jobs. Um, you know, a variety of things. So those are two examples. Uh, of yeah, thank you. And let me just carry this theme a little further. Uh, Aspirant, the, um, there are clear co-benefits from doing a better job with soil stewardship as well. And, and I wonder if when you look at the sort of full set of motivations, whether the thing we really need is to increase investments in encouraging uh, carbon sequestration in soils, or whether we can actually just anticipate an increase in carbon storage through encouraging farmers to take up best management practices that also protect the soil for the long term and increase fertility? I think um, a mix of both, but if I had to choose one, I would go with a latter uh, kind of strategy of aiming to improve soil health and improving the, uh, the soils around the world that are now degraded. Just to give you, to put it into context, close to half of world soils, in particular working lands at this point are considered degraded, meaning their potential to support uh, agricultural production or plant productivity for that matter is compromised. And so if we were to start with the benefit of actually improving the health of the soil um, to rehabilitate some of these degraded areas, we end up with those win-win benefits that Branson was referring to. Um, and, and this has huge motivation, obviously, because a large part of the people in the tropics in particular that have to live off of these degraded lands, maybe not hugely motivated right away from a climate argument, but they're definitely motivated to improve the health of the soil that they depend on for their food, feed, and fiber needs. That's more of an immediate need for them, right? 
Um, and in many ways, that's also a big reason why I strongly believe that um, improving soil health and soil se carbon sequestration is one strategy that to improve soil health um, should be part of any informed effective strategy for climate change mitigation. So as, as people cannot live, right, they, if they can't actually survive and they can't ensure where the meal is coming from, um, you know, next month or the month afterwards, then it's pretty hard to engage them in climate change mitigation, which is a much more of a longer term um, effective. And this is also an issue that affects a large number of people. I think it helps to remember the numbers every once in a while, close to a billion people around the world um, had lack food um, security, food and nutritional security, and also access to um, uh, secure water sources, safe drinking water sources. Um, and for those people then, for their perspective, for their immediate needs, but also for their long-term benefits, um, then it helps to cook find a way to link this discussions of improving soil degradation um, and um, climate change related mitigation strategies. Um, and I think what Branson was speaking a minute ago about effective uh, forest management also reminded me, we're in California right now, we're in the West Coast where a lot of the forests are burning. I think as a result of past management practices that did not take into consideration, at least in as much as they needed to, forest management and thinning practices that should have been uh, practiced, right? Um, and so even though, yeah, obviously, um, you know, these issues are maybe the, the potential for natural climate change solution is bigger in the tropics, but these issues play out across the world, I think in many, many different ways. And, um, and from a perspective of um, kind of soil health, to me, is, is, a, is a more just starting point for these discussions. But at the same time, I think it's also a more effective starting point for these discussions. Yeah, thanks so much. I, I do want to swing back to the fires in California, but I, I want to uh, explore one other dimension of this kind of the multi-benefit space. And, and, you know, in principle, there's a, a lot of economic value and a lot of economic potential for increasing the well-being of, of, of rural and, and poor people around the world. Uh, Becky, you've thought a lot about how you uh, sort of build a, a kind of a, a multi-resource um, accounting system. And, and when you think about the, the financial value or the potential financial value in natural science and natural climate solutions, it, should the idea be to, to just have uh, carbon payments that are doing carbon by themselves or, or are there techniques that are available now for integrating carbon payments into a, a sort of more comprehensive ecosystem services framework? Yeah, that's a great question, Chris. I think um, there's a lot of there's a lot of advantages to stacking benefits, as they say, that you can get a certain amount from climate finance, but then there's also you could be combined with payments for ecosystem services that are delivering watershed benefits or you know other benefits to you know private companies, utilities, um, municipalities, a variety of different actors who could sort of join forces to make that, um, that financing more pragmatic. Um, and I think there's, there's real reasons to expect that we could take advantage of those um, synergies, especially just recent work um, that we've undertaken with Conservation International, um, looking at the synergies between carbon, the highest carbon density places and um, a variety of what we might call more local benefits and in this case, we're talking about everything from water quality regulation, erosion control, flood mitigation, coastal protection, timber and fuel wood production, livestock production, freshwater fisheries, pollination, recreation. So we're really trying to get a holistic view of many of the benefits people are experiencing more um, locally. And globally, um, about 39% of the land area is providing the majority, 90% of these local benefits to people. Um, in the U.S., that figure is closer to about 50%. But if we took an equivalent amount of that land area um, and looked for the places that are most important for carbon storage globally, over half, 53% of it, overlaps with the most important places for, for local benefits. And in the U.S., because um, if we look at our highest carbon value places uh, in the continental U.S., not thinking about Alaska, 
that overlap is 85%, um, mainly in the Pacific Northwest and the, and the Eastern US. So it's a really compelling argument for stacking these benefits and saying this really is benefiting local people and the global community um, to the most. And, and we can uh, sort of leverage those different um, income sources so that we can actually make it possible for private landholders to, to make some transitions. At, at least in principle, my, my impression is that the actual tactics that have been discussed so far mostly have not included this kind of benefit stacking. Is that right? Yeah, I think so. Right now, what we're seeing is the convergence of a lot of different goals through the sustainable development goals and the Paris Agreement. And now we're coming up on the new Convention on Biodiversity targets. Um, there's all these, there's a great, you know, foundation for achieving you know, a lot of these different uh, goals through nature-based solutions. And I think once we can start to actually visualize the overlaps, they can all be sort of knitted together a lot more effectively. Chris, can I just add one additional point to Becky's uh, response? Just to say that, um, just flagging that, you know, so I think we mentioned, I mentioned earlier, you know, about 30% of the cost effective solution climate change, you know, we've concluded um, is, is available from, from natural climate solutions. That we think that's a conservative number because of this issue, because we haven't, in our analysis, our models essentially we're not sophisticated enough to actually include that the the other economic benefits of of, of, the, of the broad range of of, of, of um, ecosystem services of, of, of co-benefits that Becky's talking about. Um, and so, you know, it's kind of an open question as to as to once you start to sort of layer in and also sort of think about how do you prioritize the locations of investing in natural resources to also capture the, the local benefits that Becky's referring to, you know, how much more could, could it be contributed? But I, but I just would flag that, um, <clears throat> that I think this is a reason why we're actually being a little conservative right now in our, in our estimates. But there's definitely work to be done to figure out how you get an implementable program that finds a way to deliver rewards based on satisfying these multiple criteria, right? Or yeah. just, we're ready to do that. For sure. And, and I think one of the things interesting is, is that when we engage with, with, with local stakeholders, whether they're communities or private sector or, you know, whoever, you know, oftentimes at a local level, and I think Becky already referred to this, at a local level, you know, Climate issue is, is obviously a, it is a very diffuse issue for all of us. We increasingly becomes less diffuse as you know, you fires rage out west and, and and all the issues that we see. But, but nevertheless, at a local level, it is often these other values that that Beck is referring to, which are the most prominent. You know, water quality, flood control, you name it. Um, and so, so, so in effect, part of that stacking is recognizing a global value that can bring finance into things that are actually kind of um, understood at a local level as actually delivering other things. And all of which is. You know, I, I think the early parts of this conversation really uh, nailed down and in many ways celebrated the benefits of deployment of natural climate solutions, but but progress is actually kind of halting. And, and I wonder, and maybe Asmer, you could start with comments on to what extent do you think the global uh, farmer and land manager community has, has really em embraced the idea and sort of be begun to step up to recognizing what the potential is? I think to a large extent, landowners and land managers do recognize the need and that benefit derived from uh, natural climate solutions. Um, again, maybe not necessarily for the sake of climate, but because of the values that they put on the co-benefits and um, their own ability to lead, uh, to kind of lead their own lives, right? Um, so to me, when I think about this question, I, I'm more uh, thinking rather about what can the rest of us do to make sure that we can support the farmers and the land managers to actually pursue these approaches, right? What are the responsibilities of the customer and the policymaker and things like that in this discussion? Because um, at the end of the day, land managers making a decision based on whether they, it's a cost-effective strategy for them, what are the long-term costs and benefits of doing, uh, pursuing one approach versus another. Um, what I think we're missing a little bit is on the um, willingness to pay for the time and energy investment that land managers put to maintain um, the health of their land. 
but I, th but I think 200 years and more of um, kind of work on um, extension and land management practices of farmers would suggest that farmers not only understand the uh, land managers, not only understand the limitations of their land, but even recognize uh, the tipping points as critical, uh, you know, kind of intervention points, basically, if you will, uh, for when we need to step up these kinds of efforts. Um, so, yeah, I think I mean, maybe I'll stop and, there. And for if that. we wanted, if we wanted to, yeah. to go from where we are now to the next level, whether that's a doubling or a quadrupling or whatever of taking advantage of the potential of soil. So what's the missing element? I think the missing element in my opinion is um, so far, at least um, in terms of the engagements that I've had with land managers and people who advise land managers, uh, the fear is that the cost that they put into maintaining um, these approaches, these solutions, um, they might not be able to reap them at the end. Uh, part of this, I think, is simply because do you know maintaining um, best management practices on land costs time, costs money, costs energy, right? Um, and but the market is not clear is there to absorb the higher you know kind of priced commodities that are going to have to come out from their land. Um, there are some folks that have argued that if farmers can, be, can somehow figure out, if we can figure out a way to pay farmers a little bit of money for carbon sequestration, um, that, that might be the magic that's needed to get us into a much larger scale adoption of climate smart land management practices, because then we take out the risk of uh, the financial risk. Um, that farmers and land managers would have to take to implement these practices. Uh, but generally speaking, I think the benefits are out there, the demonstrations are out there. So I feel like we are on the cusp of maybe taking even more advantage of these uh, practices than we've done so far. That's great. Uh, Brunson, a lot of your work has been based on categorizing natural climate solutions based on what it would cost to implement. Uh, but then other parts of your work have really emphasized the importance of, of governance and of um, the institutions that are strong enough in order to support the natural climate solutions. Do you think having a price on carbon is the key enabler or are there other things that we need to be tackling simultaneously? Well, it, of course it's, it, you know, it's, you know, whereas as you pointed out earlier, Chris, um, you know, the, essentially, land natural climate solutions are a kind of like a more conservative option because they're they're less risky like photosynthesis works we know it you know on the other hand it's complicated right i mean land um you know land management uh at you know everything from individual to to kind of national and international levels you know involves a complex set of actors um rights uh, and you know uh, food security all kinds of things that that, that we care deeply about um, and so, so I guess when I'm, that's all just a qualifier to say, like, I don't want to suggest that there's any silver bullet, you know, that's like a magic solution. Having said that, <laughs> having said that, I would say that in my opinion, and I'm just, this is just my opinion, um, I do think that a price on carbon, um, you know, well, there are, there's a price on carbon in different places, right? Like in, in different sort of, you know, in California, there's a price on carbon and, you know, in different, in different countries, there's a price on carbon, but, 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 but globally and in most geographies, there is not yet a price on carbon. So um, I do think that a price on carbon is transformative and can't, well, if done well, and there are different ways of doing it, um, but if done well, it, um, it can be transformative. And given the number of low cost options to, um, to mitigate climate through improved land stewardship and all the windmills we've been talking about, um, you know, adding even a limited price on carbon and, and, and making that available for farmers and foresters and, 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 and communities and, and all sorts of land managers to actually sort of engage in, a, um, in that price, um, I think would be, would be transformative. I think it'd be very powerful. Now, obviously there are various other things we need to do. And I would say in that breakdown we talked about earlier of like protect, restore and manage, um, you know, each one of those kind of, I, I think, in, at least in sort of broad terms, probably has a different assemblage of solutions that, that could, could unlock them. In the protect side, that, that would not always, but it would tend to be kind of a, 
kind of a government top down, you know, uh, approach obviously needs to be very much informed by the, the bottom up. Um, whereas I think in that, in the managed part and the, you know, the parts that the Esmer has been talking about, 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 um, you know, working, you know, farmers and, and you know, foresters and the whole management of working land, that's where I think a price on carbon is, uh, can be incredibly powerful for, for, for lots of these sort of adjustments we need to make to improve uh, land management. Let me ask Becky the same question, but, but with a different twist. And uh, does a price on carbon kind of distort the balance among the different ecosystem services that, that uh, nature delivers? Or, or is it uh, the pathway to recognizing sort of fuller compensation for those benefits? I hope it's the latter. <laughs> I think there's a danger in having a, a monolithic carbon view that um, we could be designing some perverse incentives of just, you know, going for the, the highest or fastest or carbon densest forest that might be, you know, monospecific, um, not, uh, not multi-use, not multi-benefit. Um, and so to the extent that we can just be cognizant of this being a, le a lever for change for, and, for, and building the political will and the support for these programs locally by, by illustrating all the advantages if done correctly, um, then I think it really could be the key to unlocking a lot of, you know, larger capital, either from global, you know, inter multinational corporations or, um, or countries that have made commitments already that are looking to put money toward other countries um, for you know building some of that international funding base to support local communities that maybe don't have as much capital flowing in otherwise. Um, and so if, if in a particular place, a payments for ecosystem service payment program wouldn't be um, feasible locally because there just isn't enough um, buyers in that market then maybe the carbon financing could push it over the edge and actually make it viable. Yeah, and that, that, that makes sense to me. Um, we're getting close to the end of the time for me asking questions. And so people in the audience are actively entering. I see we have a bunch, but, but I do want to ask one, uh, one thing of each of you. It's important to the way we think about natural climate solutions. And it, it concerns the fact that everybody among us recognizes the importance of decarbonizing energy and industry and that natural climate solutions is a complement and not a substitute for um, decarbonizing energy and industry. Um, Asmer, do we need to do something more than recognize that it's a complement and not a substitute? How do, we, how do we make the case that we should move forward with a greater emphasis on natural climate solutions and not seem to be making the case at the same time that we can foot drag on uh, decarbonizing energy and industry. That's a very important point, Chris, right? I think we want to be very clear in the fact that we are not, you know, kind of imagining that natural climate solutions are somehow going to substitute decarbonizing um, and we need to reduce emissions. That's not a negotiable uh, strategy. And I think uh, all of us who are in, working in this space have to be crystal clear about that. But Beyond that discussion, though, I think it's also important um, to make sure that some of the academic disagreements that we have about how to estimate amount of carbon stored here and there or effectiveness of different management strategies don't overshadow the larger benefits that we, uh, or we all agree can be derived from these solutions, right? I think um, a lot of times I feel like uh, some of the some of what folks outside the disciplines hear uh, from these disagreements uh, could be perceived as somehow we don't know the benefit that could be derived from carbon sequestration exactly, or we don't know how to measure it. Um, being clear of the fact that we know a lot, there are, you know, obviously like any science field, we have some things that we would like to improve precision on or accuracy of the measurements, but we, ha we have tangible benefits that we can derive on this. And when we do advocate for natural climate solutions, that we're not just doing it uh, for the sake of improving climate and the fact that if we are going to imagine a habitable earth in the future, it's going to include healthy land that is going to support the food um, and other needs that human communities and other members of the living community on, on earth, especially on land, need, uh, right? And those 
you know, this future, a healthy future with, with abundance of food and feed um, and nutrients cannot happen unless we figure out ways to improve soil, which also then helps us with climate change solutions. All of it a win-win, all of it complementary to decarbonization, but not one or the other, in my well, opinion. Eloquently said. Uh, Bronson, <laughs> I, I wonder if I could get your thoughts on this question of how to make it clear that natural climate solutions need to be accelerated and amplified, but so do the other parts of the climate solution portfolio. Yeah, I mean, first of all, just to agree, I think with you and Esmeret, and I, I imagine, I imagine Becky as well, um, that, you know, that we have to sort of get past any, you know, the notion of, you know, either or, it has to be all of the above, right? It has to be both and. Um, but I will, I will say this here, and again, here's just like, personal opinion, um, and, you know, there's a, very, as there's, a very, there's a very active debate, I think, in the environmental community right now about this question. Um, I just, there's a good reason to raise it. Um, my opinion is that we shouldn't worry too much about this, and I think that the, that the thing that we should worry more about is that less than 2% of global investment right now in climate mitigation is going into natural climate sleep. We understand that about 30% of the cost-effective solution is natural climate solutions, right? And then we, again, all the discussion we just had about, about how that might even be conservative, you one could debate it. Maybe it's 20%, maybe it's 40%. But it's, it's a lot more than the current proportional to its solution. It's a lot more than even the, the proportionally the investment is. So, so I don't think we have that problem right now. I think the problem is that we're not investing in natural climate solutions nearly enough. Um, we may get to the point where there's a concern that we're kind of overdoing it, but I, I, don't, I don't think we're we going to need to worry about that anytime very soon. Um, and, and so the final point of this, certainly at an individual kind of level, and I, which I think is probably the source of this concern, is like we don't want an energy company to sort of greenwash by sort of, you know, investing a bunch of money and, and planting trees, but then actually doing nothing to like invest in, in, in better technologies to actually drive down their fossil fuel emissions, right? Which is the bigger, it is the bigger issue. Like we have to drive down fossil fuel emissions. So, so that at that level, I, I completely agree. But what I would, what I would point out is that, you know, in talking to economists, friends of mine, what I've you know, had explained to me is like, look, you know, th there's a perfect scenario where, you know, an energy company completely transformed their, their business model to entirely, you know, renewable energy. Um, you know, we, 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 you know, we, which all of our airplanes to battery powered and, you know, whatever we can do. Um, and that, of course, we have to do that, like by mid-century. But to get from here to there, there's a lot of cost barriers that start to kick in as you drive down fossil fuel emissions. If you add in the option of investing also in lower cost, as you hit those cost barriers, as you push up you know, on technology and things, if you add in the option of, of investing in, in natural climate solutions, which are often on the margins of the economic system, so they're just kind of, that's one of the reasons they're not invested in, because they're kind of left out of the story. Um, that allows you to do more with the same amount of money, okay? So, so for a given willingness to pay as a society, and we all have a threshold for how much, like, I pay, to, you know, put solar panels on my roof and all that kind of thing. For a given willingness to pay, we can do more if we allow uh, natural climate solutions into the system and we invest in them and we allow that kind of essentially whether it's carbon price uh, tax or whether it's a trading cap and trade system so all those reasons i think that um we would be wise to uh to sort of really encourage the inclusion of natural climate solutions into um, trading mechanisms and have safeguards for the exact reasons that, that becky indicated that we don't when i sort of do no harm policies but um let's kind of I don't know. I think we should be optimistic about um, about sort of the, the, the you know the big positive wins that we have here. Let me ask Becky the, the same question. But you know, if climate natural climate solutions are all that great, why do we need to invest more in order to bring them into reality? Why 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 aren't they taking off on their own? Oh, because we do a terrible job of internalizing externalities. So we're obviously with climate change, we've seen that we pay the price much later and we're very bad at making decisions on a very, very long time scale. But I think that's even true of all of these co-benefits in terms of water regulation and, and flood mitigation. Um, it's hard to see those immediate payoffs. And so it's often hard to, for an individual, especially when collective action is what it often takes 
um, it's hard to get that over that barrier, you know, to, to escape your inertia and, and make the change that will actually benefit everyone. So I think in having this, this kind of, you know, global or international agreement over a long time scale, it starts to push us into the space where we can basically escape that, that inertia. Okay, that has been a fantastic discussion so far. There are a whole bunch of aspects of the conversation that I want to make sure that we come back to in the in the Q and A from the uh, from all of you. Uh, in in the spirit of keeping the session interactive, I want to switch to the uh, to the second of our poll questions. Which natural climate solution do you consider most promising or attractive? This is research for us. Really, really interesting. Asmer, you, uh, you made the case. <laughs> okay, let me, uh, let me start with uh, questions from the audience. There are uh, uh, a whole bunch of super interesting ones here. Um, let me ask you a question from Melinda Belisle. Agriculture as a whole in the US had a serious consequences for the environment, soil degradation, water management, and extensive implications for climate change. Um, are we basically uh, headed for a sustainability crisis? Do we reach a point where the system ultimately runs out of resources? Uh, or, or is there a potential for transitioning to rebuilding in a way that really takes the limitations into account? And, Esmer, you're our, you're our agriculture expert. You want to start with that one? Sure. Um, I think the danger is there with if the level of uh, abuse and overuse of agricultural soils and resources that we've um, been practicing, you know, over the last however decades, many decades at this point, if it continues, the danger that the soils will continue to degrade, and as they continue to degrade, their their potential to support uh, product plant productivity and i.e. the um, the commodities that we need to get out of them. Um, gets threatened continuously, obviously, right? Uh, but we also know, I think, um, even if you could just think of many of the examples in the Central Valley of California that we have of farmers that were among the early adopters of best management practices and how they've turned um, the basically the uh, degradation of their lands uh, completely into, you know, adopting management practices that are now not just um, you know, more uh, sustainable, not just that their soils are more healthy, um, not just that their soils contain a lot more carbon, but they're also producing a lot more, they're productive, their life is a little bit more secure, right, in an agricultural system, as secure as, you know, life in agriculture can be. Um, and so I feel like a the danger's there, but I the potential is probably bigger of how we could do better. Um, right. Um, and, and the nice thing is like this, the person who asked the question asked a lot about including water management. Right. So practicing best management practices that improve carbon sequestration on soil also ha tend to have a potential to reduce water pollution risks, for example. I'll give you a local example from California. Excessive application of agricultural chemicals, in particular nitrogen and phosphorus based fertilizers, chemical fertilizers is a big reason reason why we have uh, nitrate and phosphate pollution in surface and groundwater systems. So uh, moving away from um, this excessive de uh, dependence on nitrogen and phosphorus based fertilizer systems um, towards more natural solutions that improves not just carbon sequestration, but also soil health means we reduce the amount of these pollutants that are being released in the water, not just the soil benefits. But at the same time, we also release the amount of um, non-carbon greenhouse gases that are being released into the atmosphere, including nitrous oxide, which is a major, major byproduct of excessive application of agricultural chemicals. Um, and so to me, I feel like there is a big benefit. It's not that it's you know easy or it's a quick solution, but the benefit is definitely there. Um, and I think it's important to highlight um, that benefit and the potential that could be derived from um, more improved management and climate smart management of soils around the world. Yeah, thanks so much. Uh, let me let me turn now to a question from Sherry Liskarten. And 
this question is, is California's carbon price working? Both Aspirant and Bronson say it would make a big difference. Uh, so is it making a big difference with respect to natural climate solutions? Bronson, you want to tackle that one? Sure. Um, I mean, I can, I'll just tell you more from kind of personal, um, personal experience with, with specific projects. Um, that it's made a difference. So, so let me give you an example from um, uh, from like from from southwestern Virginia, which is my home state. Um, there, there was originally a set of conservation work uh, 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 launched by the Nature Conservancy, um, which is a great partner of, of Conservation International, to, um, and, um, and 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 it was actually for for the uh, conservation of an endangered snail in the Clinch River, um, a beautiful valley in, in southwest Virginia. Um, so they set up all this conservation work to essentially to, to, um, work with uh, large landholders to um, help them do better forestry practices. Because a lot of the, the problems with sediment loads, because when you do logging, you, you can you can create these skid trails that basically dump sediment into the streams and, and damage the you know the, the ecosystem. Um, because of the California system, it created a price on carbon that was actually could be traded from Virginia. And, and that made the financing of all this conservation work to improve forestry and protect the for those forests from conversion viable. And they're rapidly scaling it up. Um, and it's been, been, so it's in a, a period of scale up. And what I've been told is once that price reaches a certain threshold, and right now, you know, I think it's like $15, something like that. Once it gets to a certain threshold above that, it will even more dramatically transform, I think, in a very positive way, um, you know, the kind of, improve land management practices we can do across across the country. So I think right now we're just seeing kind of the early signals of, of this trans, transformative power uh, of, of, of that kind of, you know, price on carbon. But I think, um, you know, it's really just the tip of the iceberg. And partly that's because California has explicit limits on how much of the cap and trade money can go into especially like forest carbon offset projects and and the standards for deploying this in the tropics are still under discussion. And and right, keeping in mind like California is like expect California to finance the entire you know carbon price for the country, not to mention internationally. So right, so imagine if if you know if states across the country were, you know, had this kind of uh, approach and you could have a much more available um, you know, for both farmers and foresters and others. Yep. Absolutely. Um, let me go to a question for Rebecca. This one's from Mary Chambers, um, are the high priority areas that Rebecca mentioned, which provide overlapping carbon sequestration benefits and local economic social benefits, mostly natural lands or working lands? I'm so glad you asked that question. I should have said that. Um, so we were unable to take into account agriculture cropland um, just because we don't have enough information right now of how different ag row crop agriculture is practiced. And this is where I think Asmeret can probably feed in a lot better information than what we have typically globally. Um, the difference between well-managed agriculture and poorly managed agriculture, I should say, sorry, row crop agriculture is, you know, it's, that's the whole ball game in a lot of ways. And so we, since we didn't feel that we could represent it accurately or um, where, you know, be able to paint it with an accurate or a, a a differential brush showing the good places and, and like poor performing places, we left it out. However, we did include forestry and rangelands. And so working from the perspective of like, these are semi-natural landscapes that are providing a lot of value to people. And that's often where you do find a lot of the win-wins. And in the future, we hope to get to that question of management. I think that's a huge, huge challenge for research to do a better job of identifying where the best opportunities to improve management actually are. But, but it's important to recognize that there are people almost everywhere in your system and that yes. uh, even lands we think of as natural or uh, often have uh, strong connections with indigenous communities or traditional land uses. Absolutely. Uh, let, me, uh, let me swing back to, a, to a, a point that Aspirant just made about the um, nitrous oxide and this question from Moffat and Googi. Uh, how important are natural solutions in non-carbon greenhouse gas mitigation or non-CO2 greenhouse gas mitigation? So um, 
this the the answer to this question i think depends on um what kind of ecosystem we're talking about in many cases right um obviously um rehabilitating say for example um degraded histosols or wetland soils if you will or mangroves um could potentially see a higher um, uh, flux of non-carbon greenhouse gases nitrous oxides as well as methane but um, if you exclude those ecosystems and you focus on more working lands, for example, rangelands and ag lands, in particular land used for cultivated agriculture, um, natural climate solutions tend to have huge improvement for reducing nitrous oxides too. I think the estimates that we have for nitrous oxide um, is a little bit less certain than we have for CO2 at this point. Uh, but the general um, observation that people have made is that um, improving um, uh, carbon storage in rangelands, for example, tends to have a, a reduction of nitrous oxide that could be something in the order of about 10, maybe more percent even. Um, just, but they are very limited, relatively speaking, compared to carbon. Even application of biochar tends to reduce nitrous oxide emissions from, uh, from working lands. Um, and so there are a range of these um, uh, reductions in non-carbon greenhouse gases that are associated with improving land management practices. But I want to add that caveat that uh, this does not necessarily capture what happens with nitrous oxide emissions, for example, in rice paddies or restored mangroves or similar systems where the hydrology of the system dictates that um, there is higher level of nitrous oxide emissions coming out of the land than you would in more well-drained uh, typical systems that we think of about uh, what in, for conventional um, and most agricultural uh, systems outside rice and, and those kinds of uh, practices. And, and your comments really highlight one of the strong motivations for emphasizing natural climate solutions is that there are some sources of greenhouse gas emissions, some from the energy and industry side and some from the ecosystem side, they're just really hard to tackle. And mm -hmm. to the extent that we're gonna to get to net zero emissions, uh, we are gonna to have to deploy as many negative emissions. Right. Yeah. Chris, just to interject quickly, that, um, to add, I think, to Esmer's response, just that our, for our global estimates, about 14% of the, of the total uh, about 11 gigatons per year that we've estimated, which is the percent solution. Um, about 14% of that is non-CO2. Greenhouse gas is much of which, as that mentioned, is nitrous oxide, methane, things like that. Um, but that, and, and so which means it's, 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 a, it's a meaningful piece. It's actually a lower proportionally than for other sectors. Um, so, so the land sector tends to be, I think, dominantly um, essentially CO2 based, but, but very much in the agricultural space, you get a much bigger proportion of them. And the, the non-CO2 greenhouse gases are ones where in some cases we, we have the uh, technology and science understanding that's ready to deploy, and in other cases we really don't. And so, you know, like a methane emissions cattle is a hard and not entirely solved problem. Mm -hmm. um, let me, let me uh, s switch to a theme that has, has come up in a, in a number of comments, but it had not really been tackled directly. And maybe start with Becky on this one. Um, and this one says, anonymous attendee, I, I apologize for not crediting the questioner, but how do you plan to meaningfully incorporate equity into climate solutions? I think, yeah, this is a, a place where understanding impacts to livelihoods and the co-benefits is so important. And so taking a, a carbon only approach would, would really have huge equity implications. So we need to think about, you know, access to resource use continuing for people and what are sustainable use patterns that could be encouraged and who is benefiting from certain projects and who's getting left out um, and who's varying the costs. Oftentimes the people living in the place that might have some protection around it are not experiencing all the benefits. There are many people that may be, you know, a little distant or downstream that are experiencing benefits and not having to change their behavior or use patterns. So I think by planning up front, you know, and understanding who are the beneficiaries of different benefits and what what are the different access needs and and uses um, going on in these different areas of high carbon value, um, we can start to answer those questions. And I think that's a that's a really key question for policymakers to be considering right now. 
Esmeralda or Bronson, would you like to weigh in on this one? Yeah, I was just, I agree with what um, Rebecca said, but uh, what I was going to add was, um, in fact, I think in my opinion, this discussion on natural climate solutions um, is one of the most equitable, I think, policy-based uh, recommendations that we can make for climate change mitigation and adaptation. Uh, because if we really care about the people who are marginalized, less economically, um, and have less economic as well as political power uh, to be part of the kind of discussions that are being had um, about climate change mitigation. Um, they're just not there, right? Um, people at the margins and people whose equity is of concern in particular in many parts of the world um, are not on the table when we're having these discussions on climate change and prioritizing making decisions and policies around this issue. Um, and. And if we focus on reducing fossil fuel, um, if we focus on reducing fossil fuel emissions, and let's assume best case scenario, we actually succeed, but we do so without actually addressing the issues of carbon sequestration in soil and improving soil conditions and ecosystem conditions that the people at the margins actually really need um, to be able to live a full life, um, then we are not really succeeding. Even at you know, best capacity with decarbonization, it means we've missed the big part of the equity picture, uh, right? Um, we, we need, to me, um, focusing on just carbon, um, reducing a carbon and not re remembering all the other co-benefits that are really critical for the lives of a big part of the world population um, is not a, a correct approach and not based on policy or equity uh, considerations or whatever, if you will. And hence, um, every time we talk about natural climate solutions, I hope we remind folks that this is not just about improving climate for the sake of um, you know, people who live in the global north, uh, but it's a, really a matter of life and death for many people um, in, most par in many parts of the world. Um, and hence, I think, um, I think it's in general, I, natural climate solutions are one of the most equitable approaches in climate change mitigation, in my opinion. Yeah, I, you know, I think it's, it's really important to recognize that, especially for the global poor, that, um, you know, at this point, access to fossil fuels is still an important part of the development pathway. And that one of the things that, um, natural climate solutions allows us to do is to make progress on climate solutions while also acknowledging that there's a, a huge amount of work that needs to be done to make the you know, non-emitting technologies uh, affordable and reliable and attractive for the world's poor. Chris, Chris, you want to yeah, thank you. Just to add, I mean, so first of all, just to sort of completely agree with um, what Becky and Asmert have said. Um, and just to add, I think, kind of, I, I guess a note uh, uh, to add, which I think is already you're hearing um, from, from my colleagues, but a note of optimism about this is that, is that at a macro level, so first of all, we have to do it right. It's complicated. <laughs> There's lots of dimensions. We have to do it right. We don't have much time. Like we can't, you know, let the perfect be the enemy of the good because we don't have much time to, to really, really transform land use globally. Um, so we're, you know, we have to accept that we're not going to do it perfectly, but, but, um, but we have to be very thoughtful as we, as we proceed. Okay. Having said that at a macro scale, the good news is that when you think about, okay, so the 70% of the solutions in the tropics, okay, tend to be developing less wealthy countries. Um, the majority of the emissions are coming from the North, right? From wealthier countries like our own. Um, so there is a, for, for the benefit of all of us, right, for the, the, the most rational thing to do is to have a transfer of um, essentially of, of financing to uh, these you know, developing countries that can you know, build, build back better, that can build green um, and, and essentially provide a service to the world in the form of um, a, a better land stewardship and, and the resources to, you know, supporting communities and all the other actors to, to do that. And by the way, even within our country, I think the similar story is, right? I mean, so we're talking about sort of, um, you know, wealthier, um, you know, elements, uh, those of us in, in, you know, tending to be in urban areas and, and you know, essentially having some, some transfer uh, um, uh, resources to, to you know, uh, 
less well-off rural areas that um, can invest in these solutions that are needed for all of us. So, so I do think that at a macro scale, um, there's a positive alignment um, in terms of equity. Um, and it, let's just say improved equity. Having said that, you know, there are lots of details that we have to get right in, in avoiding kind of perverse outcomes, which, which you know, Becky and Esther mentioned. Yeah, let, let me turn to uh, an issue that's very much the issue of today sitting here in, uh, I don't even know how to describe uh, Central California today. It's sort of orange, orange world, post-apocalyptic orange world. Uh, when we think about the, the fires on the West Coast, you know, what are the implications of the kind of environmental impacts we're seeing uh, for our ability to deploy natural solutions and for the um, immediacy and the imperative to, to get them going? And Becky, you want to start with that one? Oh, wow. Um, shoot. <laughs> I think I'm very, um, very daunted by the fire situation, especially in California right now. And I think... Um, Probably others, maybe even Bronson, maybe you would speak better to, to the specifics on, on fire and, and natural climate solutions. But one thing I do think is really important is um, somebody I saw asked about um, kind of what, how can prescribed burns be um, integrated, you know, supported by the public when people are getting so fearful about wildfires getting out of control. And I think you know, prescribed burns is, is one aspect of forest management, but also just thinning and more active forest management is a huge, huge problem that, you know, the U.S. Forest Service is pretty underfunded and cannot physically get around to all the places. I was just up in Tahoe last weekend, and there's huge burn piles where they, they've piled things up to come back and burn them in the winter, um, and they just can't get around to them. It's just, as you know, as far as you can see, just hundreds of, of burn piles. So I think, you know, getting funding for forest managers to be able to do the work that they so desperately want to do and don't have the capacity to do is, is a huge issue for us right now. And there's some interesting um, uh, mechanisms, I think, at play, not just through climate finance, but also through, um, again, sort of more an ecosystem service-based view of things um, by connecting utilities that are facing a lot of risk from catastrophic fires that would, you know, potentially gum up their, um, their utilities through the uh, landslides or through sedimentation of, of water resources. Um, but they don't necessarily have the upfront capital to, to take on the forest management that's needed. Whereas a longer term actor like pension funds um, that are investing in things over the very long term do have that upfront capital and could invest. And we see this happening right now in California in a climate resilience bond, a forest resilience bond, um, that a, a number of different actors are getting together to try to do this, to, to take on the forest management upfront that is, you know, provides an extra capital to make that possible. And then the utility can pay it back over time from the benefits that they're receiving of, of more stable flow of water. Um, so I think there's, there's definitely opportunities. I'm not going to suggests that the challenge isn't huge and really scary in California, but, but there are some, some hopeful possibilities. But emphasizing that the cost of protection can be quite modest relative to the amount of benefits that are delivered. And, and I think that, that a reduction of fire risk is, a, is a, a beautiful, horrifying example of where we, where we really should be making more investments. Um, uh, Bronson, you want to weigh in on the fires? Yeah, well, thank you. So just, yeah, I mean, building on what Becky said, I mean, I do think there's, this is a nice connection to, to our, you know, the prior conversation is that, you know, here we are, you know, massive unemployment, you know, need for, you know, for, for you know, a series of waves of stimulus packages, you know, job creation programs. Why not, um, you know, you know, job creation, uh, you know, in rural areas to, 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 to invest in better forest management on both, um, you know, both, both federal lands and, you know, and, and beyond. Um, you know, you think about back in the, you know, in the Great Depression, right, you had sort of, you know, all, all kinds of these kind of these kind of programs and, and absolutely, we could do the building back better as a way of improving resilience, you know, mitigating climate change, um, you know, and, 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 and jobs. So, so but there's a lot of alignment here, um, you know, that, that, that there are opportunities. The one thing I want to flag kind of is in addition to that, I, th I think might be, I think is a sort of maybe a, a broader point that, that, that I think is, is 
related to your question, is I think there's a fair amount of angst, understandably, when people are looking at you know all these pictures on the news of, of like fires burning all over you know in Australia, in California, all over the place, and they're like, wait a second, you're telling us to like invest in forests? Like <laughs> they're burning. Like why would we invest in storing carbon in forests if they're all burning? So my response to, to that would be that the vast majority of forests are not burning. Um, you, it, it is a huge issue where they are burning, but keep in mind that that that, that the global ecosystem, you know, set of ecosystems are actually very resilient, and you have at, at there's a certain set of them that are at a sort of transition areas, right? In the Mediterranean kind of systems, forests. You know, you know, unfortunately, are kind of close to sort of transition between forest and non-forest. And what that means is when you sort of nudge them a little bit, you see dramatic outcomes. Most of the systems that we're talking about are not quite that close. So what we're seeing right now is the canary in the coal mine. The issue is this, is that if we, so we don't have the option, we simply don't have the option of not investing in restoring um, and, and protecting these systems. Because if if we let climate change get too far, which it will if we don't do all of the above strategy, right, fossil fuels and land sector, let it get too far, more and more systems will start to approach those thresholds. And the amount of carbon stored in ecosystems is something like five times that stored in the atmosphere, right? So, so just think about it. Of only losing a small percentage of our, of our, of our forests and other ecosystems through these, through these kind of threshold kind of position processes, Essentially, it's catastrophic. Like we, we can't go there. So, what we can do about it is we can, you know, protect, restore, and better manage systems in ways that increase their resilience. We can practice a little bit of triage around that, right? By sort of, well, if we're going to reforest the system, let's reforest where, you know, in places where they're not likely to transition out of a forest ecosystem in the next couple of decades, right? So we can be a little, and then, you know, and let's invest in, you know. Um, uh, anyway, so, so we, we, there is a little bit of a triage game to be played, but, um, but uh, you know, keeping in mind that globally, uh, ecosystems are still a net stink for our carbon pollution. They're actually doing the reverse. They're actually net sequestering. Um, so, so I don't want people to sort of um, get the impression that, that even though there are some systems that are burning, that everything's burning, it's, it's actually the reverse of that. There's CO2 fertilization, which is causing forests to actually grow faster in, in most parts of the world. Um, so that was to put a little macro <laughs> story uh, perspective on. on yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, great. And Becky, I know you wanted to weigh in with one more point on this. Oh, yeah. I just, you reminded me, Bronson, that as you're talking about the Civilian Conservation Corps and the idea of, you know, wealth transfers from not just, uh, you know, developed to developing countries, but also uh, urban to rural areas, potentially. Um, there's another note of hopefulness that um, even within our own federal government, they're considering right now, they're considering natural climate solutions. There was just a House Select Committee on the climate crisis report. And one of the things that this kind of ties back to the last point, too, that I was so impressed to see was ensuring equitable access to natural spaces and opportunities, but also equitable um, opportunities for restoration work developing and expanding environmental justice initiatives and reestablishing the Civilian Conservation Corps um, with a focus on recruiting and hiring individuals from environmental justice communities and other vulnerable populations. So I think there's a, there's a way to hit a number of problems at once with the same solution. Um, and that's just really inspiring to me. Great, thank you. Esmer, did you want to weigh in on the, on the five minutes? Um, I think they said everything that I would have said uh, beautifully. And so I agree with everything that both said. And as somebody who's lived in Central California for the last 11 years and had to see firsthand where these fires are burning, one of the fires that's burning right now is literally going through one of our research, research sites. Um, and it's, it's got to the point where there is no room for not doing anything. There's no room for not addressing this issue. And I think the risk of prescribed fires and the fear that people have about it are real, obviously. But as Becky really nicely put it, it, put it um, it's really important that we keep reminding folks that that's not the only option for forest management. And not doing anything is not an option. We're just way past the point of not doing anything. And all this discussion that we We've had about natural climate change, climate solutions um, would mean nothing if we can't manage these lands and prevent massive scale release of 
CO2 into the atmosphere that's occurring, and also large losses of natural climate solution potential um, that are happening with these fires everywhere at this point, um, right? Even within the context of this discussion. And, and with forest mortality and with- yeah, well, um, Huge with losses of soils. Yeah. I mean, that, that, uh, in the, I think it's important to balance uh, Bronson's totally correct point about the fact that natural ecosystems, well, the terrestrial ecosystems are large sink, the ocean's operating as a large sink, Yep. But the I think that's increasingly it in jeopardy as climate yep. change pushes systems further and further. Yeah. Um, let me add one or two more technical questions. This one's from Anela Arifi, who I know is writing from Bosnia today, uh, mm -hmm. and this is a question about how, how we think about uh, integrating natural climate solutions with other technologies like biofuels. And she's particularly interested in saying, you know, can we advance the agenda for natural climate solution at the same time? Uh, we introduce new crops and, and think about addressing the climate crisis in, in parallel ways, complementary ways. Yeah. I, I could start if you want. So obviously um, these uh, biofuel systems can be an important part of the solution, right? But um, the first step for me is making sure that we're not growing biofuels instead of other um, food sources that folks need, feed, and that we're not using land to grow biofuels and making, um, you know, the potential to produce food sustainably out of reach for too many folks. And, and, and we're not also compromising ecosystem health overall um, to pursue large scale biofuel production systems. There's a lot of discussion around biofuels and their potential to grow in marginal lands. Um, I like to caution people about that because if land is marginal, it's marginal for a reason. It means if you're going to grow biofuel in it, you can't do it without massive investment in supplements, it, be it irrigation water or agricultural chemicals or other things. Uh, then we're back to the cycle of the, you know, kind of conventional agricultural practices, which are really, really problematic. So even if we're deriving some carbon sequestration potential from the production, from the uh, growing of the biofuels and using them for energy, we can't be degrading the environment and contributing to release of large amounts of, um, of uh, greenhouse gases and pollutants into the environment, right? But having said that, um, certain biofuels, biofuel crops, for example, tend to be really good at, you know, perennial plants with deep, extensive rooting systems that we know have a potential to not just store, but also stabilize large amounts of carbon in deep rooted, in deep um, soil layers, which in the long term is what we want to practice. So as long as we're cognizant about the potential issues that could arise, like anything else, right, from this one particular um, option, um, I think there's a room for biofuels and all of the above kind of solutions that folks have been discussing today. Thanks. Um, let me... Uh, let me turn to a to a uh, sort of a, a how, how you fit the pieces together question. This one's from Adrian Fogel, and and the question: Given the uncertainties and the, um, the challenging issues of equity, who gets the benefits? Where they're targeted to? How you take advantage of stacked benefits in a way that we really haven't ever done before? So, what what are some concrete? policy steps that we might take in order to help put uh, California or the US or the world more on a trajectory to be able to deal with the transaction costs that are necessary to really uh, amp up deployment. Brunson, you want to start with that one? Oh boy, that was an easy one, Chris. No, I'm kidding. That's, <laughs> that, that is a, a fascinating challenge question. I mean, I would say this, I and I, I, I suspect I'm only going to be answering like kind of like one little piece of your question. Um, but I want to, I want to, I want to get off to, to, to my, to my colleagues because they might have deeper insights here um, is that I actually, so, so I think that um, what we need is really good policy with very good accounting and safeguard embedded in it. Right. So we know that the carbon story is real. It's not double counting. We know that they're the right safeguards. So we're avoiding kind of perverse outcomes that we had some talk about. Um, the, the, the voluntary market systems 
um, of which there's a lot of debate about, like, you know, offsets and all this stuff. But th those systems have been very carefully, they, there's a huge amount of thought that's gone into those because that's where it essentially gets the most scrutiny. And so what I want, one of the points I would make is, I think we, there's a lot, you know, decades of development of a lot of these. So we have the CCB standards for any um, climate and biodiversity, you know, safeguards around things and actually recognizing when those, some of these benefits are stacked. We have, a, you know, the, the VERA carbon standard, which has a very carefully designed, you know, for a variety of different types of these interventions to make sure that the carbon accounting is good. So I would say part, in part, the answer to your question, I would say is willingness of policymakers as they develop national and regional and state climate policies to actually like look towards those existing voluntary systems, which in many ways are probably like, you know, transitional as we sort of figure it out in, at national and, and, and state scales um, and, and build those in to our national system because there's a lot of work that's already been done to solve a lot of these problems. That's super helpful. Uh, Rebecca or uh, Asmer, do you want to comment? I think um, one huge transformational <laughs> change that policymakers could make is to start to align, you know, deliberately align these goals through policies that are multi-sectoral and multi-objective. So we have a lot of examples, even in the U.S., of programs that are really progressive um, toward, you know, uh, incentivizing better management, especially in agricultural areas, like the Conservation Stewardship Program or equip the environmental quality incentive program. But even those two policies aren't aligned. One, equip is more to do with water and the CSP is more to do with habitat for biodiversity. And they're not necessarily that if you can show that you can achieve both, you're more likely to receive either one. Um, and now there's a new act under review called the Growing Climate Solutions Act. Um, that's really exciting to build on those kinds of programs um, to, specifically focused toward carbon credit markets. But if there, if, if these could be aligned, then I would say the same for international policy. If the sustainable development goals could recognize that one path toward achieving zero hunger or no poverty is, um, is through natural nature-based solutions, not just to climate, but to all kinds of other um, co-benefits, um, then I think we could actually see it easier for, for individuals to take advantage of these programs and actually change their stewardship and, and, and change the benefits resulting. Um, so I would say like, there's great legislation out there, there's great policy to build from, but the biggest challenge is the people it's meant to incentivize ha have a hard time uh, navigating that complex space. Yeah, yep. That's right. what, what about this? What, what, what should we do next? <laughs> yeah, um, I think um, a little bit of, um, you know, kind of the only thing I would add to what both of the, uh, Rebecca especially was just talking about is the need to recognize that natural systems are obviously a bit more complex than our policy frameworks uh, give them credit for, right? The benefits of one don't stop neatly at this border or that border. Um, and recognizing that, um, obviously, there's a bit of a larger scale discussion to be had when it comes to natural uh, uh, ecosystem policies related to natural ecosystems in general, um, to recognize that there are many things that we could be implementing that have multiple benefits and that could address, you know, kind of issue, you know, approaches that could address, I should say, um, multiple issues. Uh, but, so, but right now, the policy frameworks that we have and the typical way that we go about coming up with policies to address um, environmental issues do not to necessarily capture that, right? We have to try to, you know, figure out something that addresses air issue and a water issue. And, um, and there are even, you know, there, uh, some people in my community would talk about how a lot of the, uh, for example, rights of the environment discussions that we have within policy circles and don't extend to soil. They talk about water that's flowing through the soil, but not necessarily soil. Um, so we have this fragmented approach at which we've gotten used to do developing policies that's not helpful. Um, but that's a much longer scale and larger discussion to be had beyond just natural climate solutions. For now, I think um, just figuring out ways we can align some of these benefits and some of these policies and form alliances that allow us to uh, develop policies and push for these kinds of policies that address multiple issues um, in, a, in an interconnected world would be beneficial. That's a fabulous place to close. I, I wanna um, thank all of the panelists for really insightful 
comments and thoughts and uh, some really in inspiring vision of where we can go with natural climate solution. I want to thank all the members of the audience as well for a, 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 for a really challenging set of questions and for uh, helping drive us deeply into many important aspects of the issue. I have one more task for the, the, um, for the people who are participating online. And, I promise not to leave, um, but I also want to thank the Wood staff for setting this up and Justin Warren for managing the, the video. It's been a, a, a truly exciting event and I, I want to leave you with just four thoughts that I think have come through from comment after comment. The first is that natural climate solutions really have huge potential. They are uh, attractive from a whole bunch of different dimensions. They're not getting the investment that they deserve and we're not taking advantage of an opportunity that's, that's really right. Of course, it's super important to keep in mind that this utilization of natural climate solutions has to be done in a, in a yes and framing and it has to occur as a complement and not as an alternative to uh, decarbonizing every part of energy and industry that we can. But I think that one of the things that's most interesting and most compelling about natural climate solutions is the really strong evidence that, that many are clearly justified, strongly motivated, even without their uh, climate implications. There are things that we can be doing, that we should be doing now, and that when we think about deployment, we often can make the best progress if we think about uh, nudging them over the finish line rather than coming up with an entirely new framework for uh, making something happen that's never happened before. And in many cases, as, as Asmer, for example, pointed out with, with improved soil stewardship, we're already seeing a lot of progress. Finally, I, I think the last few minutes have really highlighted the importance of recognizing that just as there's not a single climate solution that's going to address the whole set of problems, there's also not a single policy lever. And that when we think about deployment of natural climate solutions, we really need to think hard about um, about, modif about a, a set of, of policy levers that are tuned to the specific opportunities and the specific constraints, recognizing that addressing issues of of justice and equity and empowerment and financial development will have different aspects in different places and that we need to approach this problem with as much creativity as, as we approach it with commitment. I have one final question and uh, I gotta admit it's partly marketing for the Woods Institute for our, for our next panel of what we're gonna do our final poll question and it concerns uh, what you'd like us to see in uh, address in future webinars. Okay, we will continue the discussion we've had today and we'll talk about a wide range of other technology in the future. Thanks again to everybody. I really enjoyed the conversation. I look forward to seeing all of you online or maybe even someday in person in the future. Thanks so much.